introduce the third candidate in our uh, joint IBMBZ search, uh, Dr. Chris Martin, uh, who comes to us from the University of North Carolina, where he's an assistant professor. Uh, Chris received his undergraduate degree at Duke University. Uh, and then did a PhD at, at UC Davis working with Peter Wainwright uh, before coming here as a Miller uh, a fellow in the Miller lab. Uh, so he worked with Craig Miller and Bree Rosenblum both uh, for two, two years or three years? Two years. Uh, and then uh, joined the faculty at the U University of North Carolina where he has his own lab and has been for uh, two and a half years. Uh, Chris is uh, well known for his work on uh, fish, and in, in particular uh, for this very interesting radiation of, of pupfish, uh, which we'll hear about either today or tomorrow, I'm sure, um, that live in, in saline lakes in, in the Caribbean. And he's worked out uh, both the timing of this radiation and some of the very interesting uh, genetic details. Uh, he's also worked on, on cichlids uh, in, in Africa. So uh, a, a diverse uh, group of studies all dealing with adaptation and radiations uh, in fish. So uh, please join me in, in welcoming uh, Chris to the MBZ. So thank you so much, Michael, for that introduction. It's great to be here. It's great to be back. I've had wonderful conversations already, and I look forward to many more. So this was the most romantic image I could find for Valentine's Day. <laughs> so happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> so diversity is strikingly uneven across space and time. And we see the extremes of this diversification process within fishes. So take, for example, this African butterfly fish. It's actually two different species that have been isolated for over 50 million years. So taxonomists thought it was the same species until they actually sequenced the DNA. So one of the most extreme examples of morphological stasis. In the other extreme, consider the radiation of Lake Malawi cichlids. So over 1,000 species radiating within the span of about 2 million years, filling a diverse range of morphologies, ecological niches within the uncommon environment of Lake Malawi. So this is the epitome of an adaptive radiation. And consider this environment of Lake Malawi where the cichlids have rapidly diversified. There's actually three other lineages of cichlids that have failed to diversify in the very same environment. Whereas if we look at this African butterfly fish in the Congo River, this lineage of marmirids has, there it goes, has rapidly diversified in the same river. And coming full circle, three different lineages of marmirids have failed to diversify within Lake Malawi. So it's not just the environment, it's not just the lineage. Adaptive radiation is this interaction between organism and environment. So transient windows of ecological opportunity from diverse sources of genetic variation. And so I'm interested in developing new systems for understanding the origins of adaptive radiation. And it's not surprising that we see the extremes of this process in fishes. Fishes make up more, more than 50% of all vertebrates, over 33,000 species and counting on fish base, hundreds of new species described every year. And even within acanthomorphs, this is over a third of all vertebrates, the spiny ray fishes, over 14,000 species. This clade encompasses all of the fish species that I'll talk about today and tomorrow. So what microevolutionary processes trigger adaptive radiation and the origins of novelty? That's the focus of my talk today. I'll first introduce the rare evolution of trophic specialists within Caribbean pupfishes. And then I'll talk about how three major theories for understanding the origins of adaptive radiation are actually challenged by this system, roughly in sort of order of, of how they might be explaining this system. Ecological opportunity, fitness landscapes, and genetic constraints. And finally, I'll talk about future research directions in my lab connecting microevolutionary process to macroevolutionary patterns. So first, in case you're wondering, yes, pupfish are named after puppies uh, because they play like puppies and they like to wag their tails. And they're most famous for being isolated in these desert environments like Devil's Hole in Death Valley, Nevada, which I'll talk about tomorrow. Um, but they also have a range across the entire, entire Caribbean or switch to a different flicker. Okay, let's 
try this. <laughs> it's still being slow. Okay. Huh? Both of these tie. <laughs> okay, so they also have this range across the entire Caribbean. And their range here is shown <coughs> in blue. And across this range, all of these species are essentially allopatric generalist pupfish species, feeding on algae and detritus, except in two locations. And the first is this lake here of San Salvador Island in the Bahamas. And you see that these, salt, these pupfishes actually live in these hypersaline lakes in the center of this island. It's only 20 kilometers across, but in addition to the generalist, you find two specialist species coexisting within these same lakes. One is the scale-eating specialist, biting the scales off of passing fishes. So here it is in the wild, biting the scales off. This is slowed down, this is filmed at 500 frames per second. So 50% of their diet is the scales of other fish. And they're not just eating the scales, but they're eating the protein-rich mucus coat that's found on the side of those fish. I'm skipping ahead here. Here it is in the lab. <laughs> Look at the spray of scales off the side of that fish. So I named this species after the Latin verb squamare, which means to scale a fish, and named it the squamator. <laughs> Glad you guys like that name. It was here to stay. Now, their scale eating has evolved about 20 times within fishes, such as these shown here, but there's no other scale eating specialist within cyprinodontiforms, which covers over two thousand species across the entire planet. And to put that in context, consider that the most closely related scale eater are actually these African cichlid scale eating specialists such as this one, separated by 168 million years of evolution. So they've actually proposed this as an, a way to quantify novelty. The second specialist is this molluscivore, eating more gastropods and ostracods than the other species in these lakes. But it also has a novel <coughs> nasal protrusion shown here. And this is actually a skeletal protrusion. So here, on the dorsal process of the maxilla, shown in purple, we can see that it actually extends out above the oral jaws. Whereas the scale eater has these massive oral jaws, three times larger, and the generalist has a typical pupfish morphology that you find across the entire Caribbean. And just so you have a sense of this, I always bring props. I was trying to figure out the best prop, so it was, it was even larger 3D prints. So I'll pass around these 3D prints of these three different Pupfish skulls, <coughs> and you can figure out which is which. That one's the most fragile. This guy's the molluscivore. Do you scale each other? Or no. The, yeah, so they're roughly the same size fish. What's the scale on these? The scale. Now, I wish that they were this large. <laughs> so, you know, um, they're actually this large. So, I'll pass around these cleared and stained specimens as well. So, and this molluscivore has a novel, another novel trait as well. There's actually a fusion here between the palatine and the dorsal process of the maxilla that actually limits maxillary rotation, which is essential for suction feeding and jaw protrusion. So they've essentially traded off jaw protrusion with basically stabilizing their oral jaws for crushing hard shell prey. And I named this species after this guy. This skeletal protrusion really reminded me of this. Does anybody know this one? This guy, the brontotheer. So extinct mammal, brontotheroides, similar to a brontotheer. And here it is in the lab. It's feeding on a crushed snail shell. And see how it grabs that shell in its jaws, retracts the jaws, shakes its head from side to side. And I think that this nasal protrusion functions as a stabilizing wedge. So we see exactly the same behavior in the generalist, but without that protrusion, they seem to have a harder time holding on to that shell and maybe prying it open. Um, here's a little bit out of focus, that gets in focus. Now there's other nasal protrusions in fishes, such as these. But again, no other cyprinodontiforms have this nasal protrusion. And my favorite example <laughs> is actually this guy, Cymatoceps masutus. It's endemic to the reefs off the coast of South Africa, and it has a diet of mussels. So it may be using this nasal protrusion to pry open these mussels, but there's no videos of this anywhere that I can find. And just to give you a sense of this habitat on San Salvador, all three of these species coexist in full sympatry. They're benthic, they live in these macroalgae mats. Generalists are about 95% of the population. 
specialists, there's a scale at the very end, or only about 1% to 5%. And this is a system of speciation with gene flow, just to orient you. So there are uh, three different species. They do hybridize, but they maintain reproductive isolation in sympatry. So here I want to show you, this is a maximum likelihood phylogeny of San Salvador Island species here, as well as neighboring outgroups on other islands. And when we model shifting diversification rates for oral jaw evolution using reversible jump MC, MC approaches like Latour, we see that the highest rates of diversification are concentrated in this lineage leading to the scale eaters. And if we look at the relative ratio here, here these jaws are actually diversifying over a thousand times faster than neighboring islands. Extreme rates. Um, and this is what I like to call a morphogram. So here I'm plotting in heat colors all of the traits that I've measured on the skeleton of clear and stained specimens. And here the axis, heat colors, actually indicate the diversification rate mm -hmm. of that trait. So here we can see that the diversification is concentrated in the oral jaws for this radiation relative to these neighboring islands, which is what we expect given the massive size of those oral jaws and scale leaders. <coughs> And finally, if we model this as an OU process instead, um, using the same sort of reversible jump MCMC -MC approach, which basically means we're not specifying ahead of time where these transitions between different fitness optima occur, again, OU methods like Bayou identify that this lineage leading to these three different scale leading populations here in red are essentially adapting to a new adaptive zone, new fitness optima. All right, so this is a hallmark pattern of adaptive radiation that we expect. Now I mentioned there's a second radiation. This is Laguna Chichen Kanab, Mexico. And this is again a large lake in the center with at least five different endemic species. And as opposed to the 10,000 year old age of the lakes on San Salvador, this one's about 8,000 years based on multiple cores. But we see a different set of trophic specialists. So a piscivore here and a zooplanktivore here. And just look at the difference in the thickness of the premaxilla here. And here is the zooplanktivore feeding high speed in the lab on brine shrimp. Look at this sort of very efficient suction feeding in gracile jaws, as opposed to feeding on a base of prey here. <laughs> and what's so striking, though, we see exceptional diversification rates in this radiation as well, but in a different set of traits. <coughs> Things like tooth length and adductor muscle mass diversifying up to 130 times faster than background rates on other islands. And if we plot this, as a rate space, so these two sympatric radiations in color here, relative to background rates in other sort of allopatric clades of pupfishes across North America, what this really <coughs> looks like is a discrete difference between the evolution of ecological novelty versus just sort of ordinary local adaptation. This doesn't look like a continuum to me, this looks like discrete processes underlying the evolution of novelty. That's sort of the central unifying program of my lab, is understanding that there's additional processes driving these exceptional diversification rates. So, begs the question, why is ecological novelty so rare in cyprinidon pupfishes? And there's three ideas here. The first being ecological opportunity. Right, so we expect increased ecological opportunity drives adaptive radiation and the evolution of novelty. And sure enough, when we look at these two environments, here's Laguna Chichen uh, Kanab on the right, and San Salvador on the left. They're both large lakes, such salty and shallow lakes. They range about 20 kilometers. And they actually have identical fish communities. So both of them only have competing mosquito fishes. Some San Salvador lakes have this silver side. Um, so we should stop. Right there. That's the end of my talk. You can all go home happy. Right? This is what explains it, right? It's ecological opportunity. And indeed, if these were unique environments, like we see for Lake Malawi, the Galapagos Islands, that generally is the explanation, right? We say, here's a unique environment. There's lots of ecological opportunity. No predators. There you go. Adaptive radiation. But in this system, it's so powerful because we have lots of similar environments across the Caribbean. So here in yellow, our pupfish collections from museum records across the Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico. But here in blue are sites where I've personally collected. And in particular, in a transect around San Salvador Island, I've gone to look at salt lakes very similar to the ones on San Salvador. And sure enough, here's salt lakes supporting multiple specialist species on the left versus neighboring Bahamian islands of salt lakes that only have the generalists. They look identical, right? Essentially, when you've seen one hypersaline lake in the Bahamas, you've seen them all. 
And we started to quantify this. We actually see some of the largest lakes in our survey <coughs> do not support specialists. So here shown in brown are these neighboring islands only with one generalist species. Here in blue are those on San Salvador that support one, two, or three different species. In fact, the smallest lake in our sample supports a specialist species of pupfish. So this is in violation of the island theory of biogeography. Right? We're already sort of challenging existing theory. And we've started to measure trophic morphology here from cleared and stained specimens so across all of these populations. And when we plot this, look at the area of sampling here of these neighboring islands versus just San Salvador Island. So here in brown is the phenotypic variance there across that huge range, exactly overlapping essentially with the phenotypic variance in blue and light blue of the generalist pupfishes on San Salvador. Here's the two specialists, the molluscivore in green, the scale eater in red. And this is just a linear discriminant axis here, so we can look at these phenotypic axes that best separate out the specialists. There's just essentially these generalists look like the same species across the entire Caribbean. We see the same pattern if we look at dietary isotopic diversity. Essentially, all these blue populations of generalists on San Salvador are overlapping with these populations of generalists in brown on other islands. And indeed, if there's more ecological opportunity here, we should see increased dietary variance on San Salvador. Or maybe the opposite, we should see character displacement and reduced dietary variance. Instead, they look to be overlapping. The only difference we've found so far in ecological opportunity is a couple of these lakes supporting all three species have a few more species of macroalgae. So species richness of macroalgae communities. But these are already pretty simple communities. So what about our second idea? So here the topography of fitness landscapes is the bridge between micro and macro evolution. Right, here's the very first fitness landscape by Wright. 1932, this is his depiction of what that should look like. Just look at how complex this is, right? And he's envisioning that populations are climbing up to these fitness peaks here, that there's all these complex valleys. And to measure this, though, this is not just a metaphor. We can actually measure it in the wild. Um, we actually need to measure the phenotypes of species that we observe, uh, but also intermediate phenotypes between these species. And multiple fitness peaks on this landscape can drive adaptive radiation. Um, but at the same time, local fitness peaks can constrain adaptive radiation. So a population can become isolated on a local fitness optimum right here, right, unable to reach this higher neighboring <coughs> fitness peak. This is the classic problem in any sort of fitness optimization complex landscape like this. So what we want to do is to measure the intermediates as well. So as a grad student, I raised up all these outbred F2 hybrid population, replicated independently across two different lakes. Um, so all three species in many, many back crosses, generating over 2,000 F2 hybrids for my field experiment, showing a range of morphological variation exceeding the variance seen in the parental species. And here, I tagged them all with individual unique uh, coded wire tags, as well as photographed them bag them up in my checked luggage. Let's see, so here, put them in breathable bags. Right. Pack them into my checked luggage here. A thousand fish in each of these coolers. Finally brought them back to holding tanks at the research station on San Salvador. Built field enclosures in the wild. And finally reintroduced these pupfishes to the same environments from which their grandparents were originally collected. And here, built a low density and high density enclosure in each lake with about 100 hybrids and about 800 hybrids at high density. So I'll just refer to these as lake one and lake two throughout this talk. And set these up in March and came back three months later in July. And this might not look like much to you guys, but this, this is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. <laughs> so the field enclosures, they were still there. And they were built with a bottom mesh so I could collect all the survivors. And inside these enclosures look very similar with a macroalgae carpet. This is at the end of the experiment as outside. So then from the pre-release photographs, I took 16 linear and angle measurements to basically quantify the divergence in phenotypes across these species. Um, as well as measuring lab-reared F1 parents of each of the three species, as was shown here. And with these data, I can then estimate a linear discriminant morphospace. 
Um, so here, this is a 95% confidence ellipse corresponding to the phenotype of the molluscivore, the generalist, and the scale leader. And essentially, this axis is increasing jaw size along with all the other things associated with scale leading, like body elongation. The y-axis here is essentially decreasing nasal protrusion, which is the, one of the best discriminating traits for the molluscivore. Essentially, you can think of this two-dimensional space as a hybrid similarity index. And within this space, we can plot the hybrids. So in gray are the hybrids that died during this experiment, and then in black are the survivors. So this is the first high-density enclosure from Lake 1. This is the raw survival data. And to this survival data, we can then fit, using a non-parametric approach of thin plate splines, we can essentially estimate a surface minimizing prediction error. And so this is that surface. So this is showing survival probability of these F2 hybrids as we move across this morphospace. And I'm showing these ellipses here of the three parents just for reference, because there were no parents within these enclosures. It was all F2 hybrids. But just look at how complex that surface is. Right? We have 25% probability of survival over here, down into a valley, and then up again to this isolated fitness peak, down to less than 5% survival over here and over here. And we can cut transects through this surface, like this, between generalist and molluscivore, and then fit uh, quadratic models to actually do sort of more formal tests of significance. Again, we see significant disruptive selection on these intermediates here. We see significant stabilizing selection over here. If we cut the slice in another direction, again, we see significant stabilizing selection. And those other enclosures, so this is the second lake where I'm actually missing one of the back crosses. So essentially half of that morphospace is missing, but we see pretty similar patterns. This is basically overlapping with right here. Um, as well as an independent data set of growth rates in this first enclosure, if we just use growth rate, again, we're estimating two fitness peaks in roughly the same regions of this morphospace. Now what's so striking here is that the generalist phenotypes, so the hybrid phenotypes resembling the generalists, are sitting on an isolated fitness peak. Right, separated by a significant fitness valley and a higher fitness peak corresponding to the molluscivore. And using permutation sampling, uh, resampling approaches, this actually is significantly higher. As well as this much low, wider, basically deeper fitness valley isolating these scale leader hybrids. So the scale leader hybrids did terrible in both lakes, in both densities, in growth rate. I actually thought the opposite would occur. They're most aggressive. I thought they would dominate enclosures, and I'd have nothing but a fat, happy scale leader at the end. Um, instead, we see this pattern. But notice that none of these F2 hybrids actually fully recovered that extreme scale leader phenotype, and none of them had oral jaws quite as large. So I do think there's a third fitness peak out there. It's my white whale at this point, but I think it's out here, and that I simply didn't sample enough phenotypic variants to actually detect that third peak. But what's so amazing here is that this actually provides an unexpected explanation for the rarity of adaptive radiation across the Caribbean. So if these generalist populations found everywhere are all isolated on this fitness peak, they, the stabilizing selection would basically limit phenotypic variance and prevent them from accessing that second higher fitness peak. And, of course, the density manipulation. I did a lot of resampling permutation tests to uh, controlling for sample size to show that, yes, the curvature is higher here. So competition looks to be driving multiple fitness peaks in these enclosures, right? And so we could, could, could conclude competition and then stabilizing selection on generalists explains the rare origins of novelty, right? except that there's a big problem here, right? and that's why are these super abundant generalist phenotypes, why are they doing so well? They should be doing the worst because they have so many similar <coughs> phenotypes to compete with. Right? What we expect from negative frequency dependent disruptive selection is that as you have more and more similar phenotypes, that this fitness landscape actually changes, right? like the surface of the trampoline, right? that fitness peak should depress. These abundant generalist phenotypes should be doing the worst. In fact, we see the opposite. And I actually started to look at this in more depth. So here I'm plotting the residual survival probability of all of these F2 hybrids in both of the high density enclosures in each of the two lakes. Right, so this is essentially survival probability that's not explained by that thin plate spline surface um, relative to the 10 nearest neighbors within morphospace. So this is essentially just an index 
of the density, the frequency of competitors with similar phenotypes. Right? And if we just look at the first part of this curve, we see what we expect. Right? As you have more and more uh, dissimilar phenotypes, your survival goes up. But then it declines. The rare phenotypes do not show a fitness advantage. So the rare, these extremely rare phenotypes, it basically doesn't matter how many competitors they have, they're doing poorly. And we see that sort of similar trend in the second leg. I think this is overfitting here, but we see this do, uh, decline as well in the advantages of those rare phenotypes. So why is this? So competition might be acting and explaining this pattern, but this really looks like performance of those hybrids. If you're not an efficient feeder, it doesn't matter how many individuals you're competing with, right? Your fitness is going to be terrible. And I've also used a general additive modeling approach to get at this more explicitly. And the models that include that spline term for frequency fit the data slightly better than models with no term at all, um, but much better than, than models that just have a linear term. So either there's an effective frequency dependence on this residual survival probability that is nonlinear like this, or there's no effect at all. Uh, but to really test this, right, we need to do a manipulation of frequency. And after all, this was just one time point, right? And, and you know what they say, right? You should never repeat a good experiment. <laughs> but I went ahead and did that. So while I was a postdoc here at Berkeley, I raised there were 4,000 F4, F5 hybrids this time. This time, thin clipped them all before release so I can go back to their genotypes and manipulated frequency of these extreme weird phenotypes just by eye as I'm tagging them um, instead of by density. And so here's what this looks like. This is the basement of LSA. Here's my little fish room here. I realized there's actually over a thousand hybrids within this one little tank. So this is about 20 aquaria total. Um, first problem, right? why you should never repeat a good experiment. <laughs> Notice that there's four different crates, each packed, <coughs> packed with a thousand hybrids each here. So this is after two months of raising these up in the lab. Then when I get to San Salvador <laughs> Island, three crates arrive. So SFO actually lost one of the crates, <laughs> containing, never to be found, containing over 1,200 fish. So I went ahead and set the field enclosures anyways. I still had enough hybrids to do the experiment. This time they were three times larger in both of the same two lakes in roughly the same areas. And then it reintroduced those hybrids after tagging them for weeks and sort of went home happy. Right? And I was like, okay. Second problem. <laughs> <laughs> Hurricane Cristobal. And look, right here is San Salvador Island. Right here is the eye of that hurricane. Um, this is me actually getting extremely lucky because the hurricane veered away at the last minute. I was, of course, watching the weather reports, and I went there anyways as the hurricane was bearing down on the islands, and they were still there. It was just a little bit choppy, but I went ahead and collected the first enclosure, because after all, it had been about two and a half, three months already. Right? And so, third problem, 77% of these hybrids survived. That's not what you want when you're doing a survival <laughs> experiment. It basically reduces your power to detect anything there, essentially, right? Um, and then when we fit a thin plate spline to these survival data, sure enough, a flat fitness surface. All right, so directional selection, yes, but we're unable to detect any curvature if there's curvature there. Luckily, I left those second set of enclosures out there. I said, like, I realized as I was collecting the first set, I was getting way too many, it was insane. And for a year, they sat out there. And this is what they looked like at the end of that year. Uh, this is my just crazed expression, <laughs> surprise expression to see them out there after a year. Fourth problem. 1% <laughs> survival after a year. Uh, so I've really narrowed down the window of how long we should be doing these experiments now. <laughs> so there are about 20 survivors out of about 1,000 between these two enclosures. Uh, and we had 4,000 total because we had four enclosures here. But look at how clustered they are. <laughs> and we should definitely sort of take this with a grain of salt, be cautious. But there's, yeah, so five, six, seven, eight, nine, all within this region of the morphous space, none of them over here. And similarly over here, we see them all right here and then a gap right here. Right? And I haven't even finished measuring some of these hybrids. So this is Lake 2, 
And sure enough, when we look at the thin plate spline, the thin plate spline does detect this pattern. So it does detect that there's two fitness peaks. So this is in lake two, that high frequency diverse phenotype enclosure. And again, we see here's the generalist, the scale leader, and the molluscivore for reference. This is a whole different set of, so some overlapping traits, I think it's 30 traits this time, or 25 this, <coughs> traits this time, um, instead of the original 16, um, as well as these original parental species measured again for reference. And then in the second low density, low frequency enclosure, it's only detecting this one fitness peak, potentially just because of not enough sampling in this area where the molluscivore is. But I want you to notice is look at how similar in location these two fitness peaks are relative to this generalist parental phenotype for reference. So even when we add all of these competitors over here, it doesn't really shift the location of that generalist fitness peak that much. And if we go back to that first high, high frequency enclosure from Lake 1 and we force it to have curvature, Again, we see here's the parental ellipse corresponding to the generalist. This is the fitness, fitness peak. There's a valley. This is the fitness peak corresponding to the molluscan core. So, and this is, uh, right, so this is still should be taken with extreme caution, but just to look where these fitness <coughs> landscapes would be if we had more power, they're all lining up here. So in conclusion, let's see, generalist fitness peak seems to be stable across different lakes, across different frequencies of competitors and different time periods. Right? This is the opposite of what we expect from negative frequency dependent disruptive selection and the sort of traditional caveat about studying fitness landscapes. And also realize that most speciation models are built on the assumption of negative frequency dependent disruptive selection. Right? That's how they get their selection that drives speciation in so many of these models. Instead, what we're finding is that I think performance, and this is me speculating here, but I think the performance shapes the topography of these complex <coughs> fitness landscapes. So the location of that generalist fitness peak. Whereas competition is mainly acting within that single peak. So I do think there's still negative frequency dependence, which we did pick up on in that spline study, but it only acts within a short phenotypic distance. So when they're extreme enough to be on separate fitness peaks of generalist and muscovore, they're not sort of competing in the same way anymore. Final caveat here about fitness landscapes. Of course, there is no single fitness landscape. Everything I've talked about so far has been two dimensions of a sort of composite linear discriminant in the axis. But this was just a fun study to take six functional traits on the puffish phenotype and look at their two-way interactions with fitness. And we see that we see landscapes with two peaks, like I've been talking about, for some interactions. But in other interactions, we see a single fitness peak. There are flat landscapes even three fitness peaks down here for the interaction between lower jaw length and body depth. And in particular, we can think about how multiple fitness peaks in some dimensions actually equal a fitness ridge in other dimensions. And my grad student, Joe, has led this project now to look at transcriptome sequencing for the early developmental stages of pupfishes. But he actually found an example of this already in the evolution of parallel expression in specialists. So here in blue is just the list of differentially expressed genes that are actually shared between generalist versus snail leader molluscivore comparisons and generalist versus scale leader. And we found far more are shared. So they're expressed, not just the shared gene, but they're expressed in the same direction, shared between these two comparisons. But when he looked at the gene ontology categories for these shared genes, he found that most of them, there's an overrepresentation of metabolic process genes. Whereas he, when he looked at the genes that were diverging between these two specialist comparisons, there was an overrepresentation of cranial development and pigment biosynthesis, just like what we expect, right? They're very divergent in male breeding coloration and cranial structures. But here, both trophic specialists have shared adaptation to this higher trophic niche. And so essentially, they're adapting to a diet higher in metabolism in the same way, using the same gene expression pathways. This is just a fun example of how trophic morphology might be two peaks, but specialist metabolism might be one peak for this radiation. Okay. So finally, genetic constraint. All right, and we can think of this as anything from just generally genetic diversity, increases intraspecific genetic diversity, 
all the way to hybrid swarm, maybe we need a source of Dodzinski Muller incompatibilities from highly divergent species to drive the speciation process, all the way to single alleles, right? Maybe we need a specific adaptive allele to trigger the speciation process. And first, I looked at uh, this is there increased genetic diversity on San Salvador. And for my whole, about six, six years of studying this system, I really thought this was going to be the explanation. Right? Because when we look at San Salvador, we see these large inland salt lakes. Right? So there should be more genetic diversity. But sure enough, I measured genetic diversity on these other islands, and they're all the same. In fact, one of them has even more genetic diversity. So essentially, there's enough gene flow that it homogenizes genetic diversity across all of these island lake populations. And what about hybrid swarm? So my colleague calls this my spaghetti plot. Um, so here, this is a population graph of Caribbean populations where the maximum likelihood tree is shown here in black. And the orange and the yellow arrows indicate direction of migration, so fitting migration events. And in fact, as I fit more and more migration events, the likelihood of these models did not level off until we reached about 20 migration events. So gene flow is pervasive across these islands. And I would suggest that if hybrid swarm was really driving this radiation, we should see all of these arrows pointing into San Salvador here. So here in black, red, and green are the San Salvador radiation. In gray are these neighboring islands. That's not what we see, right? Instead, we see these arrows pointing every which way. There's gene flow everywhere. It's not unique to this island. So that leaves us with adaptive introgression, where a specific adaptive allele is needed to drive this radiation which is particularly weird, right? If there's so much gene flow, why would that be limiting? <coughs> so here, my fantastic second year graduate student, Emily Richards, has taken the lead. And here's Joe and Emily in the field in San Salvador collecting pupfish. And Emily and Joe have found, first of all, that out of 12 million SNPs, that there's only 120 fixed SNPs between the generalist and the molluscivore, only 1,500 between the generalist and the scale eater. And looking at some of these fixed SNPs, very few show signatures of introgression. So less than 1%, 0.006%, that is, um, this is percentages, not even proportions, of these fixed SNPs show evidence of both the selective sweep and introgression. So basically, are they more similar to outgroup islands than San Salvador populations? And we see that for both generalist, molluscivore, and, and scale leader comparisons. But within that tiny percentage of the genome that shows signatures of sweeps, we see some outstanding candidates. So this is a ski allele. This is the gene ski. There's a region right here that shows elevated FST between generalists and molluscivores, um, elevated DXY, so elevated absolute divergence. Um, and then F4 statistics, so basically more uh, similar ancestry here with outgroups on Nassau than with other fish within that very same lake. So in violation of this tree-like model of divergence that we expect. And finally, we see reduced uh, genetic diversity here in the specialists, as well as signatures of a sweep from Tachimus D. And we can see that region. So here it is. It's segregating in the generalist. And here's the molluscivore. Here's the ciniatus, which is the described species from Nassau that we're finding that introgression signal from. We don't see this at all in any of the scale leaders. And what's so striking here is that this ski is involved in TGF beta signaling and this mad dependent pathway. But knockouts in mice actually phenocopy the molluscivore phenotypes that we see. So we see this depressed nasal ridge here, as in mice, similar to molluscivore, as well as extended maxillary protrusion here. And Emily has dated this to about 10 to 25,000 years ago. So here's again a population graph showing the strongest admixture event into the molluscivore. And this makes sense. So this huge area here is the Grand Bahama Bank. Here's tiny little San Salvador Island on its own. And about 10,000 years ago or more during the Pleistocene, so sea levels were about 200 foot lower here, this would have been exposed, potentially forming massive salt lakes and larger genetic diversity back then. And indeed, we do see evidence of a past population bottleneck when we look at uh, PSMC plots. And we see this signal for other genes as well. This one is also involved in craniofacial patterning, similar signatures. And everything seems to be coming from Nassau instead of the southeastern Caribbean, where we also looked. Um, so these are sort of our top 10 best candidates for adaptive introgression. So what's going on in Nassau? 
So here, indeed, we find our most interesting outgroup pupfish population. So not just generalists, but this thing, about one in a hundred fish have these enlarged jaws, slightly different patterning. None of them have the scaling behavior. Um, so we're sure it's basically trying to work on this and understand what's going on. But in fact, we found these alleles in the generalist type phenotypes here. So it seems to be segregating not just in Nassau, we've also found it now in the Exumas, <coughs> some of these neighboring islands, but we don't find it in the Dominican Republic. So why is trophic novelty so rare in Serpentidin, Cyprinidin puffishes, right, to sum up? So either scales are present, right? So why not scale-eating puffish? So one possible explanation <coughs> is that it's due to subtle increases in species richness, ecosystem productivity. It could also be due to the prevalence of stabilizing selection and empty fitness peaks across the Caribbean. <coughs> or finally, it could be due to rare adaptive introgression from distant islands. And I'm very sort of relieved and happy to tell you that my NSF career was recently funded, recommended for funding, to do exactly this. So look at ecosystem productivity across the Caribbean, measure fitness peaks on these neighboring islands, integrate that with my teaching, so a scaling performance landscape is what we're going to be doing, as well as look for more signals of adaptive introgression across the Caribbean. So we've started to do that already. So here we've started doing voucher specimens and inventories of macroalgae richness across San Salvador, and we plan to do biomass surveys. So this is in collaboration with Dr. Paul Gabrielson, who goes by Dr. Seaweed, and he's already discovered a new species right here with barcoding. And we're doing the same thing for macroinvertebrate diversity, so quantifying relative abundance, diversity across these lakes, in collaboration with Dr. Gustav Pauli at the Florida Museum of Natural History. And we're looking at net primary productivity within lakes using dissolved oxygen probes and sort of the comparison between night and day productivity, which is sort of a standard measure in ecosystem science. And the second project, third time's a charm, right, <laughs> is actually take these hybrids populations to field enclosures on neighboring islands. So I've already sourced out two different neighboring lakes that are very similar to the San Salvador lakes and some of the closest uh, within the Bahamian island chain, where we can actually ask if we detect fitness landscapes in these lakes where there's no molluscivore, that would be strong experimental evidence that there's an empty fitness peak in these lakes, if the ecological opportunity really is similar. And within San Salvador, there's a lot of variation in macroalgae richness, even within a lake. So we can sort of use these sort of natural variation to set up experiments and see if macroalgae structure and richness is really the factor that's affecting these fitness landscapes. And finally, these are some of my students in my class from this fall and this spring. I teach a course called The Evolution of Extraordinary Adaptations, where we're actually trying to measure a scale-eating performance landscape in class. So the students take high-speed videos of scale eaters. This one's grainy, I know, but it was taken by the students um, on their own, and so we can train them to feed on euthanized zebrafish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, go back to this guy. <laughs> oh, there. And this is actually an F1 hybrid, so we can also start to get F1 hybrids and F2 hybrids to look at their performance. Um, and finally, we've expanded this sampling now from 40 genomes to 140 genomes, um, from Venezuela all the way up to Massachusetts, and basically also focused on four focal outgroup populations where we'll look for signal signals of hard selective sweeps. So a key criteria being, if we see a sweep on San Salvador, we shouldn't see it anywhere else. And then we know that it may actually be functioning in, in some of this species diversification there, as opposed to just universally selected for alleles spreading across the whole environment. Next, uh, I'm also funded by the Binational Science Foundation with my colleague Roy Holzman and Joseph Weda to look at how performance landscapes influence adaptive diversification. Right? And so of course not all of you can breed hybrids and take them back to the wild. Right? So this is a method where we can actually take high-speed videos of suction feeding in fishes and then importantly sort of plug that into a hydrodynamic model of suction feeding performance, which basically predicts a complex performance landscape, and then ask how that complex landscape, how does that mesh with adaptive diversification for these suction feeding traits that we see? So here's Roy's uh, rig. This is in the Red Sea, where he actually has a tether to the shore so he can do high speed suction feeding videos in real time, just with a click of a button from his office desk. Um, so this is the Chromis sort of feeding out there. 
Um, and he has this hydrodynamic model so we can take six kinematic, key kinematic variables like ram speed, time to peak gait, and predict suction feeding performance on three different prey types, sort of universal prey types, evasive prey, zooplankton prey, and attached prey. Um, and then with this suction feeding model, we can already sort of simulate what that complex landscape looks like. This is a tiny region of that landscape um, just varying some of these variables, but we see it's already complex. There's some ridges here of performance. And with this complex landscape then, we can use information from that landscape as priors to sort of set bounds on different aspects of macroevolutionary diversification for kinematic traits in fishes. Not just reef fishes, but pup fishes. This could apply to any sort of uh, performance-based system. Right? And so potentially the performance landscape could inform the position of those fitness peaks within an OU framework. It could even inform a discrete matrix of evolutionary transition rates. So in collaboration with Josef Weta, he's basically extending his Bayou package to be able to propose this complex performance landscape or any sort of fitness landscape as opposed to the very simple model of OU, which is just a single fitness peak. Right? But then we can actually ask, does this shape adaptive diversification? Does performance shape adaptive diversification within these environments? So finally, uh, I would be thrilled to bring ichthyology back to the MVC um, in the new era of phenomics. I would say we're already well into the era of genomics, but of course initiatives already occurring here are things like CT scanning all fishes, right? So and where to start even, but even if we looked at things like acanthomorphs, I would be looking at the species level, micro CT scanning, but also combined with automated landmarking, which I think we're going to have to do and there's lots of new possibilities now with machine learning. And then finally, using these new multivariate comparative approaches to identify key evolutionary transitions across these groups. And for me, my lab, this is still a starting point, but it's something I would really love to be involved in. I think is a lot of fun, and I think it's sort of one of the future directions for museum curators. But second, at the population level then, sequencing is already so cheap that CT scanning is getting there, that we can actually do GWAS level sampling of focal adaptive radiations that we then provide as just open source digitized radiations, not just the CT scans themselves, but the genomics of that. So to talk about these directions. So first of all, acanthomorphs, one third of all vertebrates, where to start? There's actually an unnamed clade right here, clade seven, contains over 6,000 species, all cichlids and all cyprinodontiforms, which contain pupfishes. This is, of course, my favorite clade. <laughs> and it contains some of the most extraordinary examples of evolutionary novelty within fishes. The repeated evolution of four-eyed fishes in both the Ganges and Central and South America. Flying fishes. It contains Nothobronchius killifishes, which are now a model system for aging. Amazonian leaf fishes. This fantastic phallostethidae, which actually has modified their entire pelvic and pectoral girdles into a raptorial genitalia, um, their internal fertilization. And then we have independent evolution of live bearing so many times within this group, as well as independent evolution of annual piscivores like this massive guy, and of course the extremes of cichlid body size and body shape diversification. Um, we're also well into the phenomics era, so the overt initiative, which is already happening here, of course, with Carol and Michelle and probably many others. These are David Blackburn's. CT scans, but here he's showing you can not just get the skeleton now, but with things like DICE CT, you can get all of the soft tissues, the, the neuroanatomy, everything. And of course, Adam Summers and I have already started scanning cichlids. Um, all 25 cichlids are now scanned, and I'll talk more about those tomorrow. But I've talked to both of these guys, and of course the question is what happens after we scan all fishes? <laughs> But I think we're already there. So Doug Boyer at Duke already has an automated landmarking approach where he can basically create a mesh of landmarks across any skeletal bone. Right? And then we can use these landmarks, so geometric morphometrics, not of the whole organism, which I think can be misleading, but actually individual skeletal elements. And combining that with these new comparative methods for estimating complex fitness landscapes. Right? So here's a general model that actually already came out this year, this past year, where we can propose, estimate a complex landscape from data. Um, so imagine this morphogram, instead of just pupfishes, 
all of these clade 7 acanthomorphs where we can see these shifting diversification rates across the skeleton, across this group, not in about 10 dimensions here, but in about 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 dimensions across the entire skeleton. Um, that would provide an excellent starting place, I think, for next future investigations. Right? And then at the population level, I basically would digitize key adaptive radiations across fishes. So not just the Cameron Crater Lake cichlids, which I'll talk about tomorrow, but also these 1,000 species of Malawi cichlids. There's only 75 resequenced genomes now, but what we need to be doing is tens, hundreds of resequenced genomes per species across populations in this lake. This is actually sort of a natural, excellent population for association mapping to really track this history of radiation. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. I've run out of time. Uh, thank my wonderful lab. Here we are collecting pupfish, uh, especially all the museums that have provided specimens for this research, as well as Sarah Dallinger did that cover photo art of the scale leader. All the funding organizations, <coughs> undergrads at UC Davis, Berkeley, and here at UNC. And thank you all for your attention. So before we take questions, I just want to remind everyone that there is going to be a reception, a uh, dinner reception tonight uh, for Chris Martin at Jim McGuire's house, 140 Ardmore Road in uh, Kensington. And with that, we'll open it up uh, for questions. And I'll let you call on people. Oh, great. Maybe we'll, well, we'll give people a chance to escape from the room. And, Okay, questions? <laughs> well, I have a question. <laughs> Everybody else is gathering their thoughts. So, um, you know, what I take from this, in part, is in all of these lakes where you don't see a radiation, uh, you're arguing, in part, that the generalists are stuck on this adaptive peak that's not actually the highest peak, and if, and if uh, uh, you know, if you can move them off there, then then you, you might get these these specialists. So, and you started by talking about Wright's adaptive landscape, but you didn't mention his shifting balance idea. So he had ideas about how populations might move off those peaks into into uh, new areas. Um, so I, I guess the first question is, I mean, you think he was wrong about that? And <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so there's two parts to that, I think, talking about, right? I, I mean, so shifting balance, so the idea that sort of these genetic drift can perturb you off of these fitness peaks, right? And we don't see evidence for that. And even in populations where drift should dominate, like the devil's hole puffish, we don't really see uh, sort of radiations, right? Or, or lots of, of that kind of work at all. And so there's been some great rebuttals of that. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely side with Coyne on this one that we just we don't see evidence for it. Um, but he has another idea that I do love. I mean, that landscape I showed you was a figure, but he originally conceived this right as a genotypic fitness network, and it was Simpson that came along with the phenotypic fitness landscapes that I've shown you today. Um, so I do ultimately want to connect all of this back to that genotypic fitness landscape. And I think we finally have, this was almost my whole reason of going into genetics, was really to find these sort of candidate adaptive alleles, but then to connect those back to fitness. So because I have fin clips from that second experiment and the survivors from the first, I can then go back to, you know, 100 SNPs is not many. And already we've narrowed those down to things like that. There's three SNPs within that intragrest region in a regulatory region of ski. And only one of those is the one that is only found around Nassau. The other two we think might just be neutral. Um, but looking at effect sizes of that is obviously one of our next steps, but also looking at how does that SNP interact with other key SNPs or key adaptive traits, how do they, so basically looking at fitness epistasis to basically reconstruct these genotypic fitness landscapes as Wright originally envisioned. And there's lots of really cool work on this already in things like protein landscapes, RNA viral landscapes, where they're reconstructing genotypic fitness networks. Um, and the already methods to try to sort through these sort of immense high-dimensional network spaces. 
But I, I guess... Did I, I didn't answer that. You no, know, you did. But the, 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 I mean, I guess the other, oh, yeah, well, other way of it. asking that is, it, I mean, it sounds like, would you, well, would you predict that if you put in a molluscivore and a scale eater uh, along with the generalist into these other lakes that don't have them, they do just fine? That is one prediction, yeah. I, I do side with that now. Uh, I mean, but then the next question is, well, how, why haven't they gotten there already? And I think, I think maybe one idea is that they, they are getting there all the time. Um, I do think there's lots of dispersal here, even across these sort of deep ocean trenches. But when they get there, it's one or two fish, and they hybridize, and all the hybrids do terribly. And some of those alleles, maybe they are segregating there. Um, but then the other part of that is, you know, maybe there is some aspect of ecological opportunity, and right, and maybe they have to intersect. Um, so maybe it was more like 10,000 years ago, where the environment was just right in San Salvador and nowhere else to sort of get up across that valley, and now that they're there, they're stuck there. But yeah, it it is. I don't have the answer yet, <laughs> and I think that's what's so fascinating is is some of my top guesses, like overall genetic diversity and ecological opportunity look to be wrong. It looks to be a lot more subtle than that. Uh, yeah, David. One thing that concerns me is phenotypic plasticity. And uh, I know you're going to be speaking about this tomorrow, but when they took the devil pupfish, the devil soul pupfishes out, mm -hmm. they, tried to com they tried to make the completely, the, you know, as, as perfect as they could, an artificial environment for them. Right. Uh, they changed. I mean, they got they, they got uh, pelvic fins and things that they didn't have that they'd never seen in, in Devil's Hall. I think so, I think what I've heard is that they don't actually have pelvic fins in that backup population. Ah, I think. I really but what? That, but what? But, but there, what there did was, have? Yeah, they certainly didn't look like. Yeah, because the, the fishes that uh, had given right. rise to that. Population. So the history of that, though, I think I think you're probably referring to Andrew Martin's sort of yes. work, right? Okay, okay, okay. So the update. Because um, I actually have that in the paper too, talking specifically about is it genetic assimilation. Um, but originally there was this concrete refuge uh, that dev they put the devil's whole pupfish into, and it's you, you know unique among cyprinodon, um, and there's some other killifishes as well in lacking pelvic fins, and it was in this refuge population for gosh, something like 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly they see the pelvic fins. So Andrew Martin sequenced them, and so did I. And by the way, we have no relation. <laughs> um, and we both found sort of uh, Myonecti's ancestry. So what we think happened is somebody, either a bird, or somebody deliberately put Myonecti's into that refuge population of Diabolus. I've been talking to Ellen Feuerbecker about their backup population that they just built, I guess, five years ago now. Um, and there, they still don't see those pelvic fins forming. And they also have a cross where there's a segregation of, so it's raised in the lab, it's a myonectes diabolus cross, and they're segregating presence or absence of that pelvic fin. So I actually think it's a genetically based trait that can be mapped that also, of course, has a sensitivity to environmental temperatures, which Sean Lima showed really well with his work. But you, you gave us almost all of genetics today. What, 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 what can you say about phenotypic plasticity? Yeah, so flexible stem hypothesis. Uh, it's sort of the idea that there's phenotypic plasticity in the ancestral population here, and potentially even genetic assimilation. And mm -hmm. so we might see genetic basis to these differences in phenotypes today. And even I actually have done phenotypic plasticity experiments with these, as well as just raising them in the lab. These traits are very heritable. We don't see much influence of plasticity on things like jaw size and nasal protrusion. And we've raised them for I have up to like five or six generations now in the lab. Uh, but that doesn't mean the ancestors weren't plastic, right? And there could have been um, ancestral variation in that. So one way to get at that, which we actually would like to do, is go to these other populations, raise them on diets of scales, on diets of detritus. And I mean, uh, Landy has this great model now that, that we should see reaction norms varying in all directions in these outgroups that then get selected on over time. I think there are experiments like Axel Meyer's early experiments where he, where he fed yeah. uh, young fish on different uh, hardnesses of prey and, and got quite dramatic differences. Yeah, and cichlids, it's super dramatic. Yeah, um, yeah like the, the minkleii cichlids, right. just a fantastic system. We do similar experiments. We fed them crush. Well, the scales itself, right? We fed these juvenile scale eaters. Some, uh, half of them got scales. 
half of them got brine shrimp. And they basically didn't grow very well on the scales. Um, and so we basically need to do that diet again, where we supplement them with something else. And in the wild, only 50% of their diet is scales. They're eating other things as well. But we also, I mean, those cichlids show huge plasticity in their pharyngeal jaws as well. These guys don't. Uh, so we've looked at the pharyngeal jaws. In fact, with some of Craig Miller's students, we actually looked at the pharyngeal jaws one day just for fun. There are subtle differences in the molluscomores pharyngeal jaws. Uh, but not, it's not dramatic the way that you see in cichlids. You have a question in the back? So in your survival experiment, it seemed like before you even subjected even the F4s and 5s to the lake, you weren't getting very many phenotypes that were like really true scale years, right? Right. Like at a much lower frequency. Do you think there's a technical reason for that, or do you think that, that speaks to this idea of genetic constraint actually making that phenotype less likely? Yeah, I guess it, I mean, it might speak to the latter. I mean, so the technical reason, I think, is, is sort of the genetic architecture of oral jaw size. I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow. We've started to do QTL mapping in this system. And we're estimating uh, basically four QTL, but so one significant QTL that explains about 15% of variance in oral jaw size. Uh, but all of those QTL are in a positive direction. And in fact, when we see strong directional selection, we expect to see this pattern of nothing but positive sort of alleles pushing you towards that new fitness optimum. Right? Um, so sort of Fisher's geometric model and the extensions of that. And that's exactly what we see. Whereas in the molluscivore, we're seeing this mix of plus and minus alleles for jaw size, for things like nasal protrusion. Right? So when we do these crosses, we get lots of transgressive phenotypes where their jaws are even smaller than the smallest molluscivore jaws. But because we're not doing, maybe we need like a, a tenth generation sort of back cross to actually get to those scalier jaws. Um, an experiment I would love to do now that we are trying to get CRISPR working in pupfish, um, as is every other lab out there, right? But ideally, we would basically just CRISPR in those mutations into a generalist background, do some allele swapping, and then measure the fitness of those CRISPR fish in the wild, if I can get permission to do that. Um, but because those alleles are out there already, I don't think this is that different than taking the hybrids back. Uh, does that, does that address you? Yeah. So, Chris, I'm trying to, f I was just, I may, may have missed something here, but it seems like you, that introgression is very much involved in, in the early stages, at least in San Salvador. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but yet the hybrids do terribly overall. Mm -hmm. So, so, to what extent is it the timing, you know, the, the, the kind of the degree of divergence between the two taxa that feed into the admix population, to what extent does that affect the outcome? Yeah, so I mean the hybrids do terribly, but we're still only in first and second and fifth generation hybrids. Um, so we're not sort of getting all the way down to, to introgress blocks. I mean that was like a 50 kV block. Um, so many, many, many generations to get to that size. So I suppose, the, yeah, which raises the question, I wonder whether, I mean is it just any old hybrid and you can see how they do? Or does it, I mean, to what extent does it, do, is it important to get the, the, the degree of divergence just kind of spot on? Yeah, my colleague's actually doing a, a project that I can't talk about now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think, I mean, I think what that really touches on, though, is, is are there any dipsensky muller incompatibilities? I mean, if these were divergent enough, then we should expect to see those. And so far... You know, we don't see anything weird. We don't see sex ratio distortion or, or any sort of, but it doesn't mean that they're not there. Um, like Molly Schumer's work, which I, I really like. Um, so that's something we actually want to do now, at least at a course level, even within our F2 hybrids, is just look for sort of allele distortions, right? As well as you know, pairs of alleles that we never see in our hybrid populations in the lab and that kind of thing. So sort of the Molly Schumer approach. But then to see are these physically linked to any of these things that look like they're adaptive alleles involved in speciation, right? And I think, I mean, there's not, like maybe Mimulus is the best example of that, but there's still not a lot of work. Like, is it, do we really need a source of divergent DMIs to really drive this process, somehow become physically linked to these adaptive alleles, or is just influxes of adaptive alleles enough? But I think that's an awesome question. It's something I'm fascinated by. 
I mean, another, another side point here, I mean, I showed you these complex fitness landscapes, and we think of this as ecology, and we've actually measured, oh yeah, I think I actually do have it here. Um, so we've measured these fitness landscapes in the laboratory as well, um, and this was a lot of survival. So this was like a two-week window, and just sort of looking at which fish died, and sure enough, they're fat, flat landscapes in the laboratory. I followed up on this with a second experiment as well, tracking their survival in the laboratory over a full year. But we really want to estimate um, laboratory fitness landscapes to try to get at, is this ecology? Or if we do start to see complex fitness landscapes in the laboratory, I mean, that's a problem. But it's also super fascinating, right? Because it suggests that a role for these interacting alleles at DMI is essentially going to be driving this complex pattern that we see here. Um, absolutely, I'd love to follow up on that. So maybe you mentioned this, and I just missed it, but did you talk about what the rate of hybridization is between these species in the natural population and why the frequencies are so low for something like the mollusca bore, which might be on a higher fitness peak? Yeah, like why do they hybridize so rarely? Do you, well, I didn't even know what the rate of hybridization was. Did you mention it, and I just missed it? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, I didn't mention it. I mean, we sort of talk about FST. We haven't done explicit demographic models yet. Um, we can sort of estimate that from for statistics from tree mix and that kind of thing. I think it's on, and also we've been using an approach called saguaro that actually segments the genome into different histories. Um, and we're getting, I think it's about 4% of the genome of the mollusca bore, uh, or 4% of the genome of the scalier that's at least consistent with introgression. Um, so it's not much, right? And it's about 3% for yeah, the mollusca bore, 4% for the scalier. Not much, but those patterns, that's sort of an overestimate because a lot of those patterns are also consistent with directional selection and other sort of weird sort of background selection things going on. Um, so why is hybridization rare? Is that the question essentially? Sure, that's, that's, a, that's a good follow-up <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we definitely, you know, we've measured... How are they avoiding hybridizing, right? Like, given that they're right there together, the same... Right, right. And so, I mean, there's lots of pre and isolating barriers, even... They're basically breeding in the very same habitat that you saw. Um, but the males of the scaleaters are jet black. The males of the molluscivores are very pale. We've started to do female follows and basically just watching these fish breed, which you can do. You can actually see the stages of courtship in these lakes and just quantify how often are males versus females choosing. And so the males are pretty indiscriminate. But the female scaleaters in particular seem to be only mating with scale leader males, and we see that in the laboratory as well. Whereas the female molluscivores in the wild, it's maybe 50-50, which is still highly significant, right, because um, they're only about 5% of the population. So the, basically generalist males are just courting anything that swims by. The molluscivore females are sort of assessing that, but they're definitely showing a preference. Um, in the lab, I'll sort of talk about this more tomorrow, but one of my grad students, Michelle St. John, is sort of leading a new sort of caged behavioral assay where we can do sort of two choice trials to measure pre mating isolation. I had a grad student do this with kiddie pools at UC Davis, <laughs> and she did find a significant preference of the female scale leaders, but not the molluscivore females, which is strange because it's a choice between scale leader males and molluscivore males, and you would think they would at least want to avoid scale eating, <laughs> and, but it was pretty random. So we basically need a more sensitive assay for that. But we've also done um, F2 hybrids, so we can actually try to look at at least QTL for mate choice and try to ask, you know, are there DMIs? Is it linked to other ecological traits involved in speciation? And basically, we'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow, but the idea is to sort of see where these alleles are coming from across the entire Caribbean. Right? And that NASA pattern, I'm hopeful, it's, weird, it's a weird pattern, but I'm sort of hopeful that what would be cool, right, is that all of these alleles might come for skeletal morphology might be coming from one location, but there might be a different source of variation for mate choice, and basically we'd like to reconstruct the, the history of all these different alleles involved in speciation. That was too long of an answer. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any more questions? If not, uh, I remind you of the reception tonight at Jim McGuire's house, and let's thank everyone again. Uh, let's thank Chris again. Uh, for